I'd like to begin by considering a painting. So this is why the PowerPoint was so important. And it's a conversation piece depicting the Stuart family, presumably at their family seat at Mount Stuart, County Down in the north of Ireland. Painted sometime between 1803 and 1808, it shows Robert Stuart, by then Lord Londonderry, his second wife Frances and five of their 11 children. Robert Stuart was a wealthy Ulster Presbyterian landowner. His ascent to an earldom had been greatly assisted by two canny marriages, both of which were made for, for political rather than financial advantage. Frances was his second wife and the eldest daughter of Charles Pratt, first Earl of Camden, a prominent Whig politician, former British Lord Chancellor, and a figure with significant political clout. For the ambitious Stuart, this union with the prominent English political heiress clearly paid dividends. In 1789, Lord Camden secured for Stuart an Irish peerage. He also acted as a mentor to Stuart's son, the younger Robert Stuart, later Lord Castlereagh, laying the foundations for his subsequent glittering political career. The appointment of Francis's brother, the second Earl Camden, to the post of Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1795, further assisted in the young Robert Stuart's ascent up the political ranks. By the time this portrait was painted, Castlereagh, who's not depicted here, had become the British Secretary of War in the Cabinet. He'd already earned a reputation as a cold-blooded reactionary, having presided with his uncle over a brutal counter-revolutionary campaign in Ireland during the Rebellion of 1798. A reputation as a arch reactionary that would of course be sealed in the aftermath of the Peterloo massacre in 1819 with Percy Shelley's damning lines in the mask of anarchy. I met murder on the way. He had a face like Castlereagh. So we might look at this painting as a representation of a highly successful political marriage. But if we look a little closer, it may be possible to discern a different story. At a time when portraits of husbands and wives were becoming increasingly informal, sentimental and affectionate, there is little intimacy, even a distinct coolness shown here between husband and wife. Lord Londonderry facing the exterior peers intently at his newspaper, perhaps indicating his preoccupation with public affairs. Lady Londonderry, a book in her lap, turns inwards to her family and the domestic interior while offering an intelligent, serious gaze towards the viewer. They do not look at one another, their bodies are turned away from one another. So I don't want to suggest that the painter intentionally um, wanted to portray a scene of marital discord, but there is evidence to suggest that there were by this point significant tensions in the London Derry's relationship. Tensions amplified by the increasingly polarized and bitter course which Irish politics would take over the course of the 1790s. And the conflict between husband and wife as I hope to show today, can in some ways be understood as a product and a microcosm of the broader conflicts that wrapped the nation during this revolutionary decade. And I know that many of you, of course, won't be <coughs> very familiar with this period in Irish history. So I'll just try to briefly, as briefly as I can, sketch out some of the background. By the late 18th century, two issues really dominated Irish politics. The first of these um, was the status of the Catholic majority, 
who under the penal laws for much of the 18th century had been forbidden from owning or inheriting land, from voting or holding public office. And those were disabilities that uh, Presbyterians also suffered to a much more limited degree. The second issue was the Anglo-Irish relationship. Though Ireland had a separate parliament shown here in the centre of Dublin, it remained economically and politically subordinate to Britain, a persistent source of grievance for the ruling Protestant ascendancy. In 1791, the Society of United Irishmen was established in Dublin and Belfast. Understanding that any effort to achieve greater autonomy for Ireland would be impossible so long as the nation was divided along sectarian lines, they called on the people of Ireland to, as the, in the words of one of their founders, Theobald Wolftone, substitute the common name of Irishman in place of the denominations of Protestant, Catholic and dissenter. Galvanised by the French Revolution, the United Irishmen campaigned for universal male suffrage and ultimately an independent Irish Republic. Although they began as an open and constitutional movement, following the outbreak of war with revolutionary France and the government crackdown in 1794, they transformed into an armed secret mass movement. In 1798, they would lead a failed rebellion the most violent in modern Irish history, which would result in over 30,000 deaths. County Down, where the Londonderry's estate was situated, was one of the most active areas of United Irish recruitment. The area's republicanism was rooted in a distinctive strain of Presbyterian radicalism, dating back to the 17th century its characters and values shaped by its democratic church structures and long experience of civil disabilities. One of the key battles of the Ulster Rebellion, the Battle of Ballina Hinch, was fought in the centre of the County of Down in 1798. But many of the rebels who fought there came from the northeast of the county, so the area around the Londonderry's estates. Lady Londonderry's relatives played a prominent role in crushing the rebellion. Her husband as a commander of a, a yeomanry regiment, her brother, Lord Camden, as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, and her stepson as acting Chief Secretary of Ireland. Yet there is, as I'll go on to show, some reason to believe that Lady Londonderry's sympathies lay not with the Redcoats, but with the rebels, and that her male relative's conduct during this period was a source of intense personal anguish. So that apparent sympathy with the United Irish Movement may appear surprising on several counts. Um, and the first of these is to do with um, Frances Lady Londonderry's background. She was English. Um, she first came to Ireland when she married Robert Stewart um, in 1775 at the age of 24. And when she arrived in Ireland, she was clearly, she clearly struggled to adjust to the politics of her new homeland. The early years of her marriage coincided with the rise of the volunteer movement formed during the American War, the Volunteers, a civilian militia, were originally established to provide local defence in Ireland in the case of a French invasion. But they soon went on to play a crucial role in the campaign for legislative and commercial independence for Ireland. And you can see here Francis Wheatley's painting of the famous Volunteers Review um, in College Green in November 1779. The volunteers' demands were reinforced by the tacit threat of military force, not depicted um, on this, in this painting, but what was present on the day of the gathering was the banner that they unfurled over the cannon that said, free trade or this. So a very kind of clear signal to the British administration about their intentions. 
The British government, severely weakened by its losses in the American colonies, um, would concede limited legislative independence to Ireland in 1782. Although Francis's husband would become a staunch defender of the British administration in Ireland and later a defender of the Union, he was at this point aligned with the Protestant Patriot opposition in Parliament, where he <laughs> I think somebody might need to mute their um, yeah. microphone. Um, so he was aligned with the Protestant Patriot oh, opposition. Um, he was a colonel in the Volunteers and also yeah. acted yeah. as an uh, aide de camp to the um, uh, commander of the Volunteers, the Earl of Charlemont. But he was opposed to Catholic emancipation, and that was the issue that ultimately split the movement um, in 1783. So for long periods, when she first arrived in Ireland in the 1770s and early 1780s, um, Lady Londonderry was effectively abandoned at home in provincial county down while her husband was preoccupied with volunteering business in Dublin. Okay. And Lady Londonderry's letters from this time reveal her dismay at her husband's absorption in volunteering politics and the politics of her new family. So she, she had landed in, in this Ulster Presbyterian family. She believed they all hated England and the English. And shortly after this review of the volunteers at College Green, she wrote to her father, expressing her concern at, quote, the independent spirit every day rising in Ireland, and her wish that, quote, her husband was less of an Irishman. If Frances had been alarmed by the strength of patriot feeling when she first arrived in the country, she seems to become increasingly attached to Ireland and concerned for its interests over the following years. And that increasing identification with her adopted homeland, homeland might be gauged from this portrait of Frances painted sometime after 1779, where she's shown posing with the harp, an emblem of Irish patriotism. And this wasn't an unusual trajectory for um, elite women of English backgrounds who had married into Irish families to follow. One of um, Lady Londonderry's neighbours in County Down, Elizabeth Rawdon, Lady Moira, had married an Irish peer in 1751 and would become one of Ireland's most celebrated female patriots, renowned for her sponsorship of research on Gaelic antiquities, her schemes to promote Irish manufactures and textiles, and her formidable knowledge of Irish politics. And you can see here on the right, this is an engraving that pays tribute to Lady Moira's philanthropic work in Ireland. But what's striking about the case of Lady Londonderry is that her increasing attachment to Ireland and sympathy for the Patriot movement seemed to parallel her husband and stepson's increasing detachment from the cause of enlightened reform and Irish parliamentary autonomy. And Lady Londonderry's political journey therefore seems to complicate established accounts of elite women's political engagement in the 18th century. In recent decades, historians such as Judith Lewis and Elaine Chalice have revealed the extent to which women of this class operated as significant actors within an unreformed political system and the influence they could wield as political hostesses, brokers, borough patrons and election canvassers. One of the most famous examples of this, of course, is Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, shown here canvassing for Charles James Fox, hence the fox tucked, tucked under her arm, facing off against Lady Amelia Hobart, canvassing for the other side in the 1784 Westminster election. As Chalice puts it, elite women's political participation, quote, was generally accepted often expected and sometimes demanded. 
But that participation was grounded in no small part in a perception that politics was a family business in which all members had their part to play in furthering the family's political and economic interests. There was therefore an unwritten rule that women's political engagement should be motivated by familial duty and attachment rather than personal or ideological conviction. And it's a model that's been dubbed namierism in petticoats insofar as it recapitulates the uh, historian Lewis Namier's depiction of Georgian politics as a world in which what really mattered was not political ideology or belief, but climbing or helping one's kin and friends to climb the greasy pole of political power and securing pensions and places in doing that. In Ireland, patriotic politics arguably offered women a more expansive role, one that was based on political principles rather than mere jockeying for position. And you can see here the women crowded into the gallery of the Irish House of Commons to listen to uh, the celebrated Irish patriot leader, Henry Grattan, to, to listen to one of his famous speeches. Yet patriot politics also tended to be a family business. And elite women were generally expected to adopt the politics of the families into which they married. So for example, when Charlotte Strutt, the daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Leinster, a family with strong patriotic credentials, uh, when she crossed the Irish Sea to marry an English Pittite MP in 1789, she initially struggled, like Lady Londonderry, to adjust her politics to this new family. But as she remarked to her mother, quote, we married women ought to divest ourselves of these family prejudices and see and hear only with the eyes of our husbands and our husbands' families. In the early years of her marriage, Lady Londonderry seems to have played dutifully the role of the political wife. As the wife of an MP, a peer and a major landowner, she was expected to politely entertain and humour those local dignitaries whose support was essential in maintaining the family's political interests. In 1785, for example, she reported her distaste at having to endure the flirtations of a local MP. But she acknowledged that, quote, as we have a county interest to establish for Robert, all this sort of stuff must be listened to. And she was clearly very invested in supporting her husband's political ambitions. Denying rumours that after her um, Robert's defeat in the 1783 election, she had dared not show her face at a local bit ball. Lady Londonderry explained to her sister that now the contest was over, she viewed the loss with complete equanimity. But while it wasn't going, quote, she would have stirred heaven and earth to have carried it. Yet there are also hints that Lord Londonderry expected his wife to play a more circumscribed role than many of his contemporaries. The Lord Londonderry may have encouraged Francis to perform the role of a supported political wife in the relatively sedate social circles of provincial down. He was much more reluctant to let her loose amidst the flashier sociability of fashionable Dublin society. Dublin Castle, the site of the vice regal court, had a reputation for extravagant display and shows of hospitality that far exceeded anything offered by the court of St. James. Vice regal largesse was understood as critical to the successful management of the Irish Parliament. Indeed, the expectation that the Lord Lieutenant would preside over an unceasing round of lavish entertainments may have proved fatal to the Duke of Rutland, who held the post from 1784 to 1787. He died in 1787, aged only 33, from liver disease that was brought on by all the excessive drinking he had to, to kind of uh, participate in during his time in Ireland. 
When Frances's father suggested in 1788 that she might leave the rural retirement of Down to accompany her husband to Dublin Castle to meet Rutland's successor, the Marquis of Buckingham, she demurred, citing her husband's jealousy and dislike of the many temptations of town. Quote, could I advance my husband's interest or contribute to his pleasure by going, I would not wait to be asked. But his interest is to have me look after his family and his pleasure to possess me at Mount Stuart. So this is one of the first hints in uh, Lady Londonderry's rather patchy correspondence of her husband's sexual jealousy, a theme that recurs and which, as I'll go on to suggest, may have had particularly painful and even fatal consequences during the 1798 rebellion. A French visitor to Mount Stuart in 1797 would describe Lady Londonderry as living in complete retirement, entirely devoted to the care of her extensive family. But there are reasons to believe that this retirement was as much imposed as chosen. Writing late in 1796 against a backdrop of deepening crisis, Lady Londonderry reported on the garrisoning of Mount Stuart, which is under armed guard and heavily fortified against the Stuart's increasingly disaffected tenantry. In March 1796, her brother Lord Camden had introduced the Insurrection Act, which allowed for the rounding up of suspected rebels and sanctioned a ruthless government reign of terror, which would soon spread to down. Lord Londonderry was threatening his tenants with eviction if they didn't swear an oath of loyalty and if they didn't enlist in the newly raised yeomanry. Many, as a result, were withholding their rent and muttering darkly about what they would do to his lordship when they finally rose. Imprisoned in her own home, Lady Londonderry unfolded her distress at this course of events. I write, she lamented, from a state prison surrounded by a guard de corps. The idea distracts me to be armed against a country that has received me above 20 years. Pursuing the parallels between her, uh, the repression of the country and her own domestic confinement, she likened her situation to that of the Belfast United Irishmen, who had recently been committed as state prisoners to Dublin's Newgate prison. She described Ireland as an amalthium home to her and her 12 children, quote, where I hope to live and die and observe its natural progress in spite of oppression with all the gratitude of a refugee with no other asylum. So here she appears to be alluding to the garden sanctuary and um, the Amalthium built by Atticus, a friend of the Roman statesman and philosopher Cicero, at his country villa in northern Greece in the first century BC. Lady Londonderry may have been drawing parallels between this classical rustic retreat and her residence at Mount Stuart, a beautifully situated country house, boasting one of the finest examples of neoclassical architecture in Ireland. But the idea of an Amalthium home perhaps signaled more than just rural retirement. Atticus's Amalthium had been a place of entertainment and instruction, adorned with art and Greek inscriptions, and at the centre of an extensive intellectual network. In describing Ireland in this way, Lady Londonderry may not only have been reflecting on the country's role in her children's education and development, but also on, on how the friendship she had cultivated there had fostered her own intellectual development. Even within the confined sphere of provincial society, she had sought out and cherished the friendships of those with whom she could flex her intellectual muscles. Her warmest praise was bestowed upon those of her acquaintance she dubbed conversable, so those she thought were good conversationalists. A particular significance here is the woman to whom this letter is addressed, Jane Gregg. Jane Gregg was the daughter of the substantial merchant and ship owner 
Thomas Gregg and came from one of the wealthiest families in Belfast. Greg was the second eldest of um, the Greg's 13 children and she's probably one of the two girls depicted on the far left of this image. She was the sister of Cunningham Greg, one of the most successful merchants in Brett Belfast, and Samuel Greg, the owner of Quarry Bank Mill in Cheshire, the hub of a substantial cotton empire. Greg, who ne never married, had a not insignificant fortune of her own, which allowed her to live a life of relative freedom, moving between fashionable literary and political circles in Ireland and England. She remains quite a shadowy figure. I've been desperately trying to research um, her life for a long time and have only turned up fragments. Um, she was a close friend and lifelong correspondent of Martha McTeer, the Belfast, Belfast based sister of the United Irishman, William Drennan. And in the 1790s, Greg seems to have become deeply enmeshed in radical politics. The Irish authorities believed that she was the at the head of United Irish Women's Societies in Belfast. And in a letter to the Irish Chief Secretary in 1797, General Lake, who was responsible for the military disarming of the North, described Jane Gregg as, quote, the most violent creature possible, who has certainly done very great mischief in this town. It's not clear when Lady Londonderry first met and became acquainted with Greg, but her letters to her make clear the esteem in which she held this lively, opinionated and intelligent friend. And you can see there's a quote here, I live such a retired life, Lady Londonderry wrote to, to Jane Gregg, I can offer nothing to an enlightened mind but the sketch of what might have been with better opportunities. But I always find that your friendship finishes the design with glow and colours, and I can assure you that to converse with you is a very great enjoyment. In their correspondence, Greg and Lady Londonderry discussed very various literary and political works, as well as public affairs. Lady Londonderry confessed her admiration for Edmund Burke's imagination and literary style, but was careful to stress to her friend how much she disapproved of his conservative politics and critique of the French Revolution. Greg recommended and sent various books, including works by the Liverpool radicals and abolitionists, William Roscoe and James Curry. Living what she repeatedly described as a retired existence in County Down, Lady Londonderry relished the access which Greg provided to a more expansive world of ideas. Greg wasn't the only friend with whom she felt she could enjoy cultivated and enlightened conversation. She also forged an intimate friendship with the Belfast physician, Dr. Alexander Halliday, a man of liberal principles and considerable erudition. Halliday had been a close friend of Lord Londonderry and the Stuart family in the 1780s, but they fell out during the 1790s as Halliday became ever more critical of the coercive and reactionary measures that were being pursued in the north of Ireland. Lady Londonderry also found a sympathetic and intelligent friend in Lady Caroline Fox, the niece of the radical Whig, Charles James Fox, who was also known to have Republican sympathies. Francis's husband evidently disapproved of and may have forbidden these friendships. It was reported that when Lord Londonderry, or the Prig, as he was nicknamed in gossiping Belfast circles, was away from Mount Stuart, that his wife would take the opportunity to secretly entertain Greg and Alexander Halliday. Lady Londonderry's reading was conducted in a similarly covert fashion. Her husband had banned the, the United Irish paper, the Northern Star from Mount Stuart, but Rev Francis was reported to have taken a private subscription. Accessing reading material that was deemed too radical or hostile to her husband and um, stepson's political interests also required some subterfuge 
Um, so she would also read the Morning Chronicle, which by this time is considered a radical Whig London um, paper. But she had to tell her husband that she only read it because she admired the literary style, not the political sentiments. And it's worth pausing here, I suppose, just to consider why Lady Londonderry may have found the ideas and the cause of the United Irishmen so appealing. Her friendship with Jane Grey provides one explanation, and um, so do, to, does her um, family background. So her father, Lord Camden, was uh, widely regarded as a champion of liberty during his, his political career. But the revolutionary politics of the United Irishmen posed, many believed, a particular threat to the property and personal security of elite women like Lady Londonderry. Many Irish women, women of her class were terrified um, at the thought that what had happened to the nobility in France during the revolution would be replicated in Ireland. Moreover, the democratic language of the rights of man espoused by the United Irishmen in many ways excluded women more firmly from the political world than a politics based on land, informal influence and dynastic interests. And this is a point that seems to have been recognised by Lady Londonderry's friend and neighbour, Lady Moira. In 1792, she mediated a meeting between the United Irishmen and her son, Lord Moira. In her letter of invitation, Lady Moira professed her openness to new opinions, her, quote, enjoyment of good sense and whatever debris it presents itself. But she continued, quote, as for making a Democrat of me, that you must be persuaded is a fruitless hope. For to keep my Monch and Clarence arms, it is more probable I should turn Amazon. And having the blood of Hugh Capet in my veins, I am from nature a firm aristocrat. So here she's really recognizing that, you know, there's nothing what's in it for her. She already enjoys considerable power as an influential aristocrat um, a, a, that would be threatened um, in a democratic United Irish Republic. But I also think Lady Moyer and Lady Londonderry's differing responsiveness to radical democratic ideas can be explained in part by their differing personal circumstances. Lady Moyer's husband was universally acknowledged to be less intellectually and politically gifted than his very able wife. And he granted her significant freedom um, through which to kind of exert her considerable powers. Lady Londonderry, as we've seen, endured a much more constrained existence. And as a result, she seems to have powerfully felt the parallels between the United Irish struggle and her own struggle against a repressive domestic regime. And this was strikingly articulated in a letter written to Jane Gregg at some point in the 1790s. Men, she lamented, expect from the women of their family a deposit for their own sentiments and no sort of opposition. Silence, though not congenial to our sex, is practicable, but by no means renders you harmless. For whatever is not positively for them is against them by their system of constructive treason. I declare I would rather see with their eyes than my own, for what advantage can arise from discovering truth if it must never be acknowledged? So this short passage sharply illustrates the political gulf that had opened up between Lady Londonderry and her family. She offers an acute critique of the conditions of elite women's political engagement, which deprive them of the power of exercising their independent judgment. Anything short of full-throated support for her husband's principles was considered a subversion of the family state. And here in an intriguing line, Lady Londonderry aligns her position with the plight of those members of the radical London Corresponding Society who in 1794 had been charged with 
constructive treason, a legal fiction whereby in the absence of hard evidence for actual treason, they had been accused of imagining the king's death. And these kind of analogies between the political state and the marital state were a long-standing feature of British and Irish political discourse. Famously, up until 1828, English law provided that a woman who murdered her husband wasn't just guilty of murder, but of petty treason, a legal expression of women's subordinate position within the family and her husband's status as the domestic ruler. And this wasn't the first time Lady Londonderry had explored the potential um, you know, overlap between the marital and the political state. Writing to her sister in the early years of her marriage, she'd observed that while she was fortunate to live, quote, under a very mild government, she had certainly enjoyed much more freedom before her marriage. But here, Lady Londonderry's engagement with these um, uh, kind of overlapping discourses acquire a much more radical and much more subversive inflection. In continuing to meet with and communicate with Greg and other known radicals, Francis risks more than just being accused of domestic insubordination. Do not be surprised, she wrote to Greg, if you hear of information being brought against a Republican countess more sinned against than sinning. Greg was clearly aware that evidence of such dissent at the heart of the administration could potentially be very embarrassing. Indeed, we only really know of the divisions within the Stuart family because Greg transcribed a selection of potentially incriminating extracts from her friend's letters. So that's the, the extract you can see here is in Greg's handwriting, not Lady L Londonderry's. Greg, who had been forced to leave Belfast for the relative safety of Manchester in 1797, then deposited copies of these letters with her brother and with William Drennan, Drennan um, the United Irishman, with the apparent intention that they could be used as leverage with Dublin Castle, were either Drennan or the Greggs to be arrested. Though Jane Gregg escaped official retribution, other acquaintances of Lady Londonderry were less fortunate. The Reverend James Porter, the Presbyterian minister of neighbouring Grey Abbey, had in the late 1780s been a regular visitor to Mount Stuart and reputedly a great favourite of Lady Londonderry's. According to Porter's son, Lord Londonderry, becoming increasingly jealous of his wife's partiality for the minister, banished him from the house and nurtured long after an inveterate hostility towards him that would ultimately result in his death. Now, I haven't been able to find anything that really corroborates that story, but it does tally with you know, some of the things that we know about Lord Londonderry and his sexual jealousy. Lord Londonderry's enmity towards James Porter is more commonly traced to um, the sharp pen satirical attacks Porter produced um, over the course of the 1790s, in which Lord L Londonderry was satirised as the figure um, Lord Mount Mumble, um, the, who was this blustering, ignorant, tyrannical landlord. And that was serialised in the Northern Star in 1796. Though Portia seems to have taken no part in the 1798 rebellion, he was nonetheless arrested and charged with high treason in 1798. Having been found guilty on flimsy evidence, he was sentenced to death. In a last ditch effort to save her husband, Porter's wife trooped to Mount Stuart with her seven young children in tow and begged Lady Londonderry to intercede on his behalf. Lady Londonderry duly composed a letter to General Nugent pleading that Porter was a man of sense and acquirements and asking that a sentence might be commuted. 
But before she could deliver the letter into Mrs. Porter's hands, Lord Londonderry arrived home. Realising what was happening, he forbade his wife from interfering and ordered her to add a postscript to the letter, asking Nugent to disregard the petition. My mother, Portia's son, later recalled, told me that nothing in her life ever filled her with so much horror as his lordship's smile as he handed her the letter with the postscript added to it. There's a real gothic quality to this episode. Portia was hanged on the 2nd of July, 1798, in sight of his own meeting house um, at Grey Abbey. Now, Lady Londonderry's intervention on behalf of Porter was by no means unusual for a woman of her class. Petitions for leniency from elite women on behalf of their tenantry were relatively common um, during and after the rebellion. Famously, Elizabeth Latouche, who was the wife of a very wealthy Irish banker, mediated the surrender of the fugitive Irish rebel, General um, Joseph Holt. But Lady Londonderry's intercession on behalf of Portia risked being perceived as a statement of her sympathies for him and his politics, rather than a more formulaic performance of a customary role. And again, contained within that episode is a sense of the domestic as a microcosm um, of, or, of or analogous in some way to the broader political conflict, the jealous overbearing husband tyrannizing over his wife as he had tyrannized over his ten tenantry, and a sense too of how these intimate enmities and jealousies could spill over into the political and judicial sphere. Her relative's political conduct would also cost Lady Londonderry some valued friends. The Lady Moria had little time for the United Irishmen's democratic republicanism. She had, by 1797, become a fierce critic of the administration's counter-revolutionary campaign. The townland of Ballina Hinch formed part of the Moira estate and had been the site of some of the worst brutality during General Lake's disarming of the North. In November 1797, Lord Moira called for an investigation into the deepening crisis in Ireland and presented to the British House of Lords, where he had a seat, a litany of outrages perpetrated by government forces, many of which had been gathered by his mother. And you can see here this print by James Gilray in which he satirises what he believed were Lord Moira's alarmist and exaggerated claims regarding British military misconduct in Ireland. Shortly after Moira made the speech in um, the House of Lords, two employees of the Moira estate, a groom and a bailiff, were arrested on suspicion of being United Irishmen. And Lady Moira believed that this was an underhand attempt by the government to embarrass her son by proving that the rebellion had spread to his own estate. She insisted that Lord Moira's servants had been bribed to conceal seditious papers on the Moira property and that Lord Castlereagh and the Londonderry set, as she described them, were responsible for the deceit. As a result, she cut off all contact with the Stuarts, including Lady Londonderry. And this profoundly hurt Lady Londonderry. Um, as she explained to Jane Gregg, quote, I never lost a friend, but Lady Moira, who was a very false biographer when she cast me with my family, merely because I am obliged to hang upon the same tree. So that rejection highlights the challenges women faced in asserting an autonomous political identity. They were obliged, in Lady Londonderry's words, to hang upon the same tree as their male relatives. Even today, historians of the Irish Rebellion often struggle to conceive of women as anything more than satellites to their male relatives' ideological planets, or to conceive of them as moving within their own intellectual orbits. Historians of elite women and Georgian politics in Britain and Ireland similarly tend to stress 
that for such women, familial and class solidarity was paramount, political belief or gender consciousness, secondary or inconsequential. Lady Londonderry's subtle but sustained efforts to exercise her independent judgment in defiance of her husband marks a deviation, I think, from that model. Female friendship, as I've suggested here, was important, as was Lady Londonderry's engagement with a wide selection of Enlightenment and radical literature. So too was her ability to find in the contest between radical republicanism and counter-revolutionary reaction, a framework through which to interpret her own experience of domestic repression and her own small acts of rebellion. It's a submerged conflict, which as I suggested at the beginning of this paper may be reflected in this less than happy family portrait. Thank you very much. <laughs>